everyone, I'm Ashley and today I want to be doing my November wrap up. I managed to read five books and two plays in November so let's just jump right in. The first book that I read in November was Poppyfield by Michael Mopogo and illustrated by Michael Foreman. This was sent to me by Scholastic for an Instagram tour and it's basically just Michael Mopogo telling the story of how the poppy came to be the symbol of remembrance. So. It's a very short book, it is beautifully illustrated, I'll see if I can show you a little peek of it. They're all black and white photos with the red from the poppy as the only colour. And yeah, I was just really intrigued about this because Michael Mopogo used to be one of my favourite childhood authors and I just wanted to see how he wrote the story basically. But I found this to be a nice little read. It was quite interesting because there was the like retelling side of it which was kind of fiction I guess but there's also an afterword at the end written by the Royal British Legion which is basically an extension of the story and how the actual symbol of the poppy came to be spread across the world and who did it, some of the women that were involved so it's a nice mix of like a graphic novel and a fiction book and a non-fiction book which was amazing <laughs> But yes, it was a really simple story and a really nice way to discover more history, so I ended up rating this one at 3.5 out of 5 stars. I then picked up another really small book which was sent to me by publishers. This one you'll have seen if you watch my most recent vlog because that's the week that I happen to read it. But this book is Fox 8 by George Saunders. This is basically a fox telling the story of how his habitat is being ruined by humans and yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect going into, well I didn't know what to expect going into this book because it's one of those stories of you know just how we need to look after the environment and things like that but I just feel like this was a really effective book because it's presented in a way where the fox is telling the story and he has supposedly learned English by listening to humans talk so everything's spelt wrong and it is written in that very distinct way so it did feel like I was listening to a fox talking which was a very strange experience because I've never had a conversation with a fox before <laughs> but it did just mean that the talk about environment and you know looking after animals hit a lot harder because it was actually coming from an animal and it wasn't just like us humans trying to get the point across again which, I mean, I know it is ultimately because it was obviously written by a human, but, you know, it's... <sighs> it just worked. <laughs> there was a scene in this which was very graphic animal abuse. I mean, not very graphic, but it was like, it just features animal abuse, which extended further than, you know, humans destroying the habitats of animals. And I wasn't prepared for that, so... You know, if that's, if you need a trigger warning for that, then here it is because it did shock me and I'm guessing that's kind of the point and it did further the story but I just kind of wish I knew it was coming because I couldn't get that scene out of my head. It was horrible. <laughs> but yeah, this also has nice little illustrations to go alongside. Don't know if you can see them, but I just think this book just thoroughly took me by surprise because to say it's so short it's really stuck with me and I did originally rate this 3.5 stars but I actually boosted it up to 4 stars because I just can't stop thinking about it and I had so much to say on it so yeah I might end up doing a full review of this on my blog because I have so many notes to talk about with it. I do highly recommend picking this up if you just want a short little read just to do with the environment. <laughs> I then managed to finish reading Between Worlds, Folk Tales from Britain and Ireland by Kevin Crossley Holland and illustrated by Frances Castle. This is exactly what it says it is, it's just a collection of British and Irish folk tales. And yeah, as soon as I saw this book I just needed it because I love reading about folk tales, fairy tales, myths and I feel like I don't hear a lot about Britain, which is surprising considering I live in Britain. <laughs> So I just wanted to know if there were any like popular ones that I've kind of missed out on or I don't know I just wanted to know what existed so I picked this up and it was very simply written but it still managed to bring through that whimsical element that I associate with fairy tales and all things like that and I do kind of 
appreciate the fact that it was simply written because while it didn't necessarily add any more to the stories, these stories would have likely have been told orally in the first place and so that would have been why they were so simple because people needed to be able to remember and recite them. And so I'm kind of glad that Kevin Crossley Holland kept it that way instead of trying to put his own mark on the stories, that he just retold them as they are, as far as I'm aware anyway. One thing I did find strange when I read it was the fact that we have stolen so many stories from other cultures and it just felt strange reading a British and Irish collection of fairy tales knowing that it's not a British fairy tale. There's two stories that I'm thinking of in particular which were basically just replicas of Cinderella and Rumpelstiltskin. And while I was reading them I was just like this isn't a British story, I'm pretty sure like these are from Germany and maybe other cultures but I just felt strange them being labelled unto Britain and I know that every story is influenced by other stories and that's just how it works but these weren't just like inspired by other stories, these were the exact same stories but under a different name and labelled as British. I don't know, it just felt strange to read about them in this collection. I mean, Britain stole a lot of things in history so are we even surprised? <laughs> Nevertheless, I did enjoy reading this one, it gave me that sort of like nostalgic feeling that fairy tales bring to me and it was also accompanied by silhouette style illustrations, if I can find one for you I shall show you. So yeah, every chapter starts with an illustration that kind of like shows what the story is about. I have written a full review of this on my blog so I'll link that down below if you're interested. But yeah, I ended up writing this one at 3.5 out of 5 stars. Now we're moving on to my university reads and I'll get the two plays out of the way because they were two of Shakespeare's plays and I'm not going to talk a lot about these because I'm just done with Shakespeare. So I do study an entire module on Shakespeare and I was willing to give him a chance because I just kind of thought that I wouldn't get along with him anyway but I was willing to give him a chance and I'm just bored now. I don't... I've given him too many chances and he's disappointed me. <laughs> but also I'm just bored of the education system repeatedly going over Shakespeare. Like, can we please normalise diversity in literature? I know it's the canon and I know he's a huge influence over literature but I just feel like I'm missing out on so many stories because we keep returning to Shakespeare. Anyway. I do think I am going to do a full video talking about the diversity in the education system so I'm going to leave this rant here <laughs> and talk about how the plays that I did read were Macbeth and Titus Andronicus. Now I thought Macbeth was going to be like my saviour in Shakespeare because it has witches in it and if you know anything about me then fantasy is my favourite genre so I thought right we have witches, brilliant. Mm, no, I was disappointed. I just, I can't, I don't know why, I just don't get along with Shakespeare. I mean reading plays in the first place is never going to be as good as watching them but I'm just bored every time I read something about him and I don't know, it's taken a lot for me to motivate myself to read his plays now. And the same goes for Titus Andronicus because again I thought I would really get along with that one because it's a retelling of the Philomel and Procne myth but no I just I don't understand it. A lot of people criticise Titus Andronicus for being too gory but that just doesn't bother me at all and it was just one of those cases for both plays where I was reading them and they just had no effect on me whatsoever. I do I did enjoy them to some extent but it was kind of like I could have taken taken it or left it. I just... I wasn't bothered. I rated both plays 3 out of 5 stars and I don't have much hope for the remaining two plays that I have to read. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Apparently I didn't get along with my uni reads from this month because the next one was Hard Times by Charles Dickens which is basically about a man who believes that everybody should be brought up on like cold hard facts you're not allowed an imagination or anything fanciful, whimsical in the slightest, you're just not allowed to stray from facts. And so he brings up his children this way and it results in his daughter ending up in a loveless marriage and his son ends up straying into gambling. It was just 
a lot of words for not a lot of events. <laughs> and apparently Charles Dickens was paid by the word, so I can't even fault him because, I mean, if you're paid by the word, you're gonna try and make your book as long as possible. But it was just too repetitive, like, it was ridiculous how repetitive Charles Dickens was in this book. And yeah, I did start out enjoying it, but I just feel like it went on for way too long. And it's also just a very agenda driven book, so the political slash like Marxist side of things is strong in this, which is why we were studying it because we were studying this one under the Marxist theory. And it also just had one of the main things that bothers me in classic novels, and that's the fact that like the main problem of the story comes from a lack of communication between the characters because other characters speak on their behalf but they say something wrong and it just takes forever for the two with the problem to actually talk to each other and I know that's like a huge thing in most books anyway when like the miscommunication is the problem but when it just drags on for so long like it tends to do in classics like this it annoys me so much <laughs> But the thing is, that was probably the only emotion that this book brought out of me, like just the frustration at it taking so long. I didn't feel anything else. I wasn't fascinated by it. I didn't care about the characters. It just was a miss for me. I, nah, it wasn't for me. <laughs> I ended up rating this one at two out of five stars. However, we now have the saviour of this month's reading because this is my last book I thought we'd end on a high and I did read this one for uni this one was for the gothic module that I'm doing and the book is The Turn of the Screw by Henry James I absolutely adored this book it was so good it's a really short gothic book about a governess who goes to look after two children while their uncle is just like left them in a house somewhere so she goes to look after these two children and she ends up seeing two ghosts who are kind of watching the children as if they want to take them. So yeah, that's the main plot of the story. And while I was reading it the first time, I was just like fascinated by the ghost story behind it. A lot of people don't get along with the writing style in this because it is quite flowery and overextended in a way. She does say a lot of words for like the simplest meaning. So a lot of people don't get along with the writing style in this, but I, kind of ran away with it because I felt like I was in her mind and she was just rambling so I ended up kind of running away with her mindset and I really loved it as a ghost story but then I got to the end and I went back to kind of like analyse the book as I do because I do annotate everything like because I do annotate my books so I did go back to like add some annotations and I actually changed perspective in a way and it became a lot more sinister. I just keep getting so excited anytime I talk about this book or I don't know, just uh, it's just such a good book and there's so many like underlying sinister things in it that you completely miss the first time round and I just feel like it's so cleverly written because it just leaves everything quite ambiguous so no one can tell you that your interpretation is wrong basically with how you read this book and I do just find that fascinating like I just think it's such a clever little book and there's so much to it I absolutely loved it I ended up writing this one 4.5 out of 5 stars <laughs> so those are all the books that I read in November I am also currently reading two books which are The Bloody Chamber by Angela Carter that one is for university I'm literally about 20 pages in so I don't have much of an opinion yet I'm also reading Northern Lights by Philip Pullman for the first time, I know, I know it's a classic fantasy book, but I just haven't read that series, so I thought December would be a good time to do it because I wanted a kind of nostalgic, fuzzy, warm-hearted type of fantasy read that would keep me sane through the exam stress of December. <laughs> So I've picked up Northern Lights, I'm about 100 pages in and absolutely loving it already, so I think it was a good choice. <laughs> but you'll see those two in my December wrap-up, and yeah, 
Let me know your thoughts on any of the books that I've mentioned in this video and I'd also love to know what your favourite book of November was. And also, do you have any books in mind that you are specifically reading in the run-up to Christmas? Because I just love knowing what people associate with Christmas, like what type of books. I know a big one is Harry Potter, I probably am going to reread the first Harry Potter myself. I'm reading Northern Lights in the run-up to Christmas, I guess, because that's... I associate that with the Harry Potter feeling, so... I'd love to know if you have anything in particular that you'll be reading. But yeah, I've rambled on enough now, so I hope you're having a lovely day and I shall see you next time with a new video. Bye!